Hello and welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 58, brought to you by Wicked Tree Gear. Today, John and I are headed south and talking Texas hunting with our buddy, Joey Blanchard. So stay tuned. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I am joined, as always, as my brother from another mother. It's been, it's been a little while, man. It's uh, Johnny the Lawman Utah on the other side of the phone here. What's going on, man? <laughs> What's up, dude? It, it has get, been a while, man. Both of us, we've been we've been pretty busy. Yeah, man. I've been, you know, we were, t- I know we've talked, whatever it was. I mean, we talk every week, but it was the one week I was having my house painted, which Yep. was supposed to take three days but took a, a full week and so it was unfortunately it was the week that i had off because i was changing jobs so I, you know you work that you kind of work that start date in there where it's like i'm leaving one starting another so you make sure you have like a gap of like a week so you can kind of chill for a week and i i did that and unfortunately they were painting my house the entire time so i basically lived and you were making fun of me because i was being all domesticated kind of coffee shop hopping so i'd have internet in a quiet place to <laughs> to work and, and shit felt <laughs> felt like a yuppie that's, it was terrible that's funny man yeah. yeah so i need a caramel mocha latte and uh what's your wi-fi password yeah exactly i was like i'm basically gonna buy this one cup of coffee and i'm gonna nurse it for four hours and they're like sir you've been here all day the yeah. <laughs> you were here when the breakfast people got here and now the after work people are here and it was like i went to the same coffee shop every day so it was like they kind of got to know me at that point but uh which They're made like, it even you're starting to creep the guest out a little bit. Are you yeah. planning like, you know, like planning something evil, you know, like what's, what's up? <laughs> exactly. I did eavesdrop on one conversation where these two, this woman and this man, I don't know if they were romantically engaged uh, or if they were just uh, friends. I'm not quite sure what the situation was, but they were both taking their pilot's license and they were going to Alaska, I think is where they were moving. And so, I was tempted to ask them, you know, to get their information, just kind of projecting into the future going, hmm, one day I might want to hunt where they are at. And could I possibly, you know, commandeer a plane for access in and out to areas by making friends with these two young pilots? Um, But then (laughs) then I thought again, I was like, I might not want to trust my my life to two people who just learn how to fly planes in Alaska during terrible weather. So. I ended up just continuing to be the creepy guy drinking his coffee in the corner stealing Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I did the one day, though, do this is even worse, um, you know, more of Yuppieville here. My wife took the one day off because she was like, oh, it's great. You're off. I'll take like Thursday and Friday off. We can hang out together. We'll paint, and you know, paint our daughter's room and just kind of do some stuff around the house. And uh, but they were still here, of course. So I went winery hopping. So I was fully domesticated, dude. I was coffee shop hopping and then like went day drink. I think I texted you because it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. And I was pretty well, pretty well tuned up. And I was like day drinking four o'clock, passed out at five, <laughs> ready to go by nine. <laughs> oh man, what a mess. Yeah. So the bummer was, was that I didn't even get to like, the weather wasn't even great. So I didn't get to scout or do any of the stuff that I really was wanting to do with my, my week off. So, you know, it was kind of a. I basically drank coffee and drank wine and, and that was about it. But so what, what have you been up to, man? I hope, I hope more exciting things than me. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I went to the Wisconsin deer show this past ah, yeah. Friday. I just went for the day just, um, you know, just kind of check it out a little bit. And, uh, that was pretty cool. Um, that show, uh, that's a, that's a really good show. You know, anybody that's in the Wisconsin area, you know, if you haven't been to that show, it's, it's pretty good. Um, draws a real good crowd and and whatnot. Um, good food, bathroom, cheese curds too far away. Uh, tons of cheese curds. Mm-hmm. You can sample cheese curds like as a whole meal. You can just <laughs> go there, starved and eat lunch for free just by sampling forty eight different flavors of cheese curds. Mm. Um, I can get down with so that. So I did that. Um. Really starting to prep for turkeys a little bit. I went ahead and set um, set one of my ground blinds up in a in a pretty good spot on my lease down the road, and nice. Um, 
it, this is that little bit of uh i guess you can call it like a in-between time frame mm-hmm. you know i'm done shed hunting so now it's all right let's go do this turkey thing for a little while and then um and then we'll start getting crazy with the trail cameras and right and, and that kind of stuff but i haven't been doing a whole bunch waiting on uh waiting on spring to actually get here Dude, you're you're not like kidding, everybody man. else. Yeah, we finally got a little taste today. I think it was like seventy today. So, and I think it's supposed to be I think eighty this on Saturday. So we're finally kind of getting into the uh, getting into the fold. I've been tr- trying to prep a little bit for turkey too. I think I, I think I mentioned it on the podcast, but I'm taking a buddy of mine for the first time hunting. He's never hunted before, so I took him to shoot. And man, I tell you what, like I, I didn't realize he shot like a lot before like he well i shouldn't say a lot he shot a fair amount i guess growing up but he's never hunted and so i really didn't expect him to be a great shot taking him out but dude nothing for nothing that dude can out shoot me with a shotgun and he's never hunted a day in his life so i don't know how i felt i don't know how i felt about that but uh took the kid out had her fire off a couple rounds getting her ready for the youth opener which will be on the 21st of of april i think um, driving the wife crazy, got a new turkey call. So I've been work, I've been working on that. On a, a side note, I'm gonna have to give you a buzz um, offline and get a and get a couple uh, slate call tips from you. Slate call Utah tips. We can do a segment <laughs> on that. Yep, not a problem. So, uh, but that those have been kind of kind of my plans, man. Do you, now, do you do how much? I mean, I know you I know you go out and you shed hunt and you scout and do all that stuff. But how much are you doing as far as like? prepping like stand locations and stuff like that are you doing any of that right now or in the in the spring or you uh, in my mind in your mind <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a dangerous yeah, place I, to uh, be i mean so when i'm when i'm shed here's my problem man when i sit in a tree stand the the entire fall i'm either critiquing the stand that i'm in or i'm already thinking like if i was to move this stand where would i move it to um so i i I'm just wired that way. I wish I wasn't. Um, I wish I could just sit down and just enjoy the moment, but I'm always, you know, stressing and anxiety or whatever, what to do next kind of thing. But so a lot of my places that I want to put stands, um, those have kind of been predetermined. So when I am shed hunting, it's inevitable that I'm going to walk near, um, you know, one of those spots. So I did get to check out a couple of my spots. Um, I did have my saw with me one day and I cut one little access trail in um, to put a stand in should I decide. And here's the problem with that. You know, I, I think that I want to stand in there now when I actually start hanging stands in like June, July, August, I may have another wild idea and I right. may abandon that spot altogether. So I usually don't get too carried away. Um, and I usually kind of wing it more, um, you know, Oh, I shouldn't say wing it. Wing it sounds like I'm just going without a plan. I have a plan. It's just that plan changes a lot. <laughs> so right. I go with the most recent plan, you know? Right. Yeah. It's version version 97. Plan version 97. But, yeah, I hear you, man. I'm, I'm kind of the – I do a little bit of trimming, you know, this time of year and try to – I always have great intentions <laughs> in, like, January. I'm <laughs> right. Like, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to – kind of map out these trees and I'm going to, you know, start to really kind of figure out what I want to do for next year. And then, you know, shit happens and I don't get out as often as I want to. And then it's, and then pretty much I spend the entire season, you know, doing run and gun sets for the most part. I might have like two set tree stands or even not even tree stands set up. I I might have like two trees like trimmed out that I'm going to plan to hunt. And then as fate has it, I don't end up hunting those trees at all during the course of the season. So I've, I try to do some, but I, I just know myself and it's going to be more of a, a run and gun, a run and gun scenario, but totally off topic here. I've been, I've been wanting to ask you this for like weeks and I keep forgetting every time we talk. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to Boston. I think I, I think I mentioned that to you for work. I was traveling to Boston and it was around Sudbury. Anybody who, you know, is from the, the Northeast area that lives in, in Massachusetts, I was, you know, in the Sudbury neck of the woods and there was this old inn, I think it was called the Longfellow's Inn. Or long, I think it was Longfellow's Inn. And it was supposed to, it was okay. on, it's online, it's like well known as being like a haunt of of that area where, you know, it's the rooms are haunted and so forth. And that's where we were staying while we were, you know, on a client trip. And um, 
I didn't have any paranormal activity per se, but like everyone there swears by it. I'm curious if if Utah believes in ghosts. Totally not deer related, but have wanted to know whether or not you believe in the paranormal. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm almost afraid to say no because I don't want to be like Oh, you're gonna get jinxed. Haunted. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um I am a very, very, um, I think it's right, considered right brain. Um, I'm very much what I can touch, what I see, what I know is real. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Right. Um, I mean, my degree is in science, you know what I mean? Right. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my thing. Um, but I was going to say, I feel like there was a, butt coming. <laughs> there's a, but yeah, there's a, but, um, I, I have never personally ever seen like an object move. I've never seen a ghost that I know of. Um, but I have some very, very good friends that I trust. They've got no reason to lie about certain things. And then there's witnesses to their stories, you know, mm-hmm. and they've got these crazy elaborate stories of these ghost stories and stuff like that. I don't know if it was like drug induced or right. what the heck was going on, but man, I'm telling you, I'm, I think anything's possible, you know, after 15 years in law enforcement, um, I've almost learned to believe a 10th of what I see and a third of what I hear, you know? Right. Yeah. Like, I, that's just me, man. What about you? You, you it's- like into the Ouija board or you believe in the ghosts and goblins or what? Well, I mean, you, you were, what, what was it? The one day we were talking about, we were actually on the podcast and you were using the Ouija board to predict something like, Oh, it was the moon phase is yeah. what it was. <laughs> um, yeah. So, well, man, like I said, that's I, now that stuff, those board games, I'm I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really kind of one of those make it happen make your own luck kind of a, a person. But at the same time, I'm not going to say that there's not, you know, there's not some ghosts. I mean, I don't, I don't believe in zombies. Right. But I believe there's could be some paranormal stuff going on out there. Some, some weird weirdness. Yeah. So, so I, so it's, it's weird, man. Like I, I will say that I do to an extent. I don't believe in like the white sheet looking dude floats around your house and scares the shit out of you and and does stuff like that. Like I'm not digging on that. So my grandparents' house or my step grandparents' house was, was haunted. Right. I called bullshit on it whenever I was a kid until the day that like my mom and stepdad were leaving work or leaving for work super early one morning. And we had to go stay at my like ridiculously or like three o'clock in the morning or something like that. And we had to go stay that morning at my grandparents' place. And we'd already always heard that it was supposed to be haunted, my sister and I. And they didn't have like a guest, like the guest bedroom that was there was like one of those ones that's like really nice that no one ever uses, you know? So it's like we ended up just sleeping on like air mattress on the floor because it was, you know, super early. And we laid down in the, in the living room and the living room went out into like this little dining area and then down this set of like quarter stairs. And then you made a left-hand turn. It went down to this old basement. It's an old farmhouse that's on a couple hundred acres near, near a creek. And... They always said that it was haunted and I didn't believe them until I'm laying there trying to go to sleep. And my grandpa told me that there was two haunts. There was an old lady and an old woman. The old lady, my grandmother swore by it too, said she would wake up some mornings or at night, whenever, and there would be an old woman crocheting in her rocking chair next to her bed. Said she was a sweet old lady and never harmed anybody. The other person was the an old man who was the husband of that old lady who was in the basement because my grandpa had a uh, like a woodworking shop in the basement and he was downstairs with like a woodworking apron on and my grandpa had seen him sometimes and he said every now and then he would bounce a basketball like for whatever reason he would like knock one of the ball because the the, uh, the bin with all the toys for the grandkids was downstairs so it had basketballs footballs baseballs bats whatever and he said he would knock like a ball or something out of it and that's how he first knew of him and that's how he kind of found him i guess and so i'm laying there sleeping one night and or that early morning and dead quiet in the house and all of a sudden i just hear like the methodic bounce of a basketball like someone's dribbling not like you know it fell off the fell off the top of the toy bin and just rolled like 
someone bouncing and dribbling the basketball intently. Like, and you know the difference being a Kentucky guy, right? Like basketball, it's like there's a different sound. And from that day on, I was like, all right, I think ghosts are real. So I might be a kook, but that scared the living shit out of me. And now I'm afraid to say that I don't believe because I feel like that ghost is going to come back. So, <laughs> so there's that. That's yeah. I, yeah. You can keep all that, dude. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's a. Uh, it was kind of. It was kind of creepy. My sister, of course, you know, got upset about it and whatever. Because you know, being the great brother that I am, I woke her up and told her that there was a ghost downstairs. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> which was uh, probably not the the best move necessarily. But looking back, when I'm kind of glad that I did because she wasn't very nice to me growing up. So maybe, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, man. So I think ghosts. Um, they might be might be a might be a little bit real. Um, but speaking of ghosts. You're uh you're gonna go chase hopefully not some ghosts in in Texas this uh yes this fall and uh yes. and uh you know we, we have a, a super awesome guest on that we need to get dialed in uh, Joey Blanchard is a you know he's become a buddy of mine we met over over you know social media and so forth and uh, he's a fellow who's followed the show and we kind of struck up a conversation and then when we started talking about wanting to do some more things that were related to the South I was like man we need to you know try to focus on some of our friends and stuff like that to you know hunt the south and bring some of those folks on and so he and i just started talking and he was like yeah i'd love to come on you he's killed some nice deer he's hunted like a combination of you know public and private ground and hunted a bunch of different states in the south and then of course you're going to get ready to go to texas and so it just seemed like it was the perfect opportunity you know i know texas is something that you've not hunted that type of terrain in that type of country before and so it was one of those things where can we bring some love to some of our you know southern brothers and uh, also get you a little bit of a little bit of info on some of the things you might need to consider since you know the train will be a little bit different than you're used to. So that's the uh, that's the plan for today. What do you think? You ready to uh, rock and roll and get Joey on? Yes, sir. Let's do it, man. I need awesome. to I need to brush up on the old Tejas style of hunting. Awesome. Yes, indeed. So before we do that, though, let's take a quick minute here to recognize the partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. First and foremost, this podcast is brought to you by Wicked Tree Gear, the longest, lastest, fastest cutting, toughest tree trimming equipment you've ever used. Simply put, the toughest saws on earth. Right now, when you visit WickedTreeGear.com, use the promo code TRUTH at checkout and get a 20% discount on your wicked purchase. We're also brought to you by Exodus Outdoor Gear. The new Exodus Trek is a byproduct of all the consumer voices who've been excited about what Exodus Trail Cameras has to offer but just can't fit a $200 in their uh, camera in their budget. And that's okay, not everyone uh, is gonna drop 200 200 bones on a camera. And uh, you're in luck though, however, a budget-friendly camera backed by the industry's leading warranty is now here. The Trek comes in at $145 price point, has the same same proprietary shell that you've come accustomed to that is rugged, that uh, lives on the Lift Series camera, as well as the series of the same five-year warranty and unmatched customer service policies. 0.7 second trigger speed, photo, video, time lapse, all those great features that you've come to love with the, the Lyft cameras. And you also get approximately 20,000 images on a set, one single set of lithium batteries. If you'd like to learn more about Exodus trail cameras, you can check them out at exodusoutdoorgear.com. If you like what you see while you're there, use the promo code TRUTH and save yourself 20 bucks at checkout. We're also brought to you by Tecamani Seed. As we are talking about Texas, Tecamani Seed originated in Texas, but it doesn't just flourish in Texas. It flourishes in every part of the country. So whether you are from the South, the Midwest, the Northeast, the North, the West Coast, wherever you might be, Tecamani Seed has your food plot needs covered. Visit tecamani.com and check out their product selector tool to help you pick the right seed for your food plots. Use the promo code TRUTH at checkout and save 20%. And last but not least, we are brought to you by Glacier Coolers, simply the world's finest. Whether you're hunting, camping, or fishing, which here in like a week, we'll actually be able to do all three of those in Pennsylvania. You'll enjoy smarter design, stronger construction, and superior insulation of Glacier Coolers. Visit them at GlacierCoolers.com, promo code TRUTH, and save yourself 20%. And now let's bring on Joey. All right, we are live. Welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And like John and I mentioned on the upfront, uh, John is headed to Texas. So we what the, thought, what the hell? Why don't we bring a dude on that does some hunting in Texas and really all over the South? And like I had previously mentioned, he and I have kind of struck up a little bit of a bit of a friendship. So we've had a couple of phone calls between uh, the time that we 
met via telecommunications in, in this podcast record, but I'm super stoked to have my buddy Joey on. Joey, how you doing, brother? Clint, how you doing, brother? I'm doing all right, man. I'm hang I'm hanging in there. How's uh how's the road treating you? Where are you at? Man, the <laughs> the road has been treating me good and I'm actually sitting right outside of Nashville. Uh right now I'm actually actually closer to Jackson, uh, Tennessee. Uh at a love truck stop for the evening. Nice. I'm out, out of driving time. Nice. You you avoiding a lot lizards? Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't seen too many lot lizards uh, around this particular truck stop, but uh, they're, uh, I'm sure they're around somewhere. Right. They're never, they're never too far away. It might be like, you know, light, light hits them. They just kind of scatter when it gets dark to come back out. So it might not be quite dark enough yet, possibly. Yeah. I just, they can just, uh, I just assume they stay <laughs> <take> away. <laughs> Don't need to get that new, that new truck all messed up, man. You know, they'll bring, they'll bring the bad juju no, on the no. truck. You know what I mean? No, not at all. <laughs> nice. So, hey, I, I know that you and I, you know, have gotten acquainted with one another and know a little bit about it, about each other and stuff. But for those out there that are listening that, you know, don't know who you are, if you wouldn't mind, just give us a little bit of background about yourself, you know, what you do for a living and how you started hunting and so forth. Uh, sure. Well, um, I've actually, uh, I was actually a fishing guide for 20 plus years. Uh, prior to that, I was actually a professional bass fisherman and uh, I got it in Southwest Florida for, like I say, a little over 20 years and uh, moved to Texas a few years ago and uh, sold my business um, that I had down in Florida. Uh, bought an 18-wheeler, uh, went to uh, got my CDL license, and now I'm uh, driving a big rig on the road. Nice, man. So how'd you? So your hunting voyage, man, did you, was was getting started hunting, was that something that was just kind of in your family that was kind of one of those things where, you know, come hell or high water, that was going to be something you did because it was just, you know, part of the family tradition, or was it something you kind of got into on your own? No, um, actually, my, my dad was a was an avid outdoorsman. He was, a, uh, he was actually a professional bass fisherman way back in the day. He was actually one of the, uh, the pioneers of the, of the Bass Angler Sportsman Society, and uh, he was huge fisherman and, and also uh, a big deer hunter and uh growing up uh i kind of started probably like a lot of other people uh dove hunting uh going squirrel hunting uh my dad started taking me deer hunting when i was about eight years old uh i wasn't allowed to carry <laughs> to carry a weapon but uh he would take me to the woods and uh we would hunt, uh, primarily back then we were hunting kind of northern Mississippi. We, we hunted some private land, uh, a lot of national forest land. And needless to say, low deer numbers, pretty high hunting pressure back then. And uh, my dad was, was a uh, very persistent hunter. He did not just climb up at before daylight and get down, you know, at 9 o'clock. We would sit till 1030 or 11. And back then, not very comfortable uh, accommodations. We were, <laughs> this was more back in the area of cotton picker spindles and drilled into a tree and sitting on a two by four, uh, just, just a tree branch. Right. Well, you know, that was not back, very good gear. That, that was back in the day when safety was paramount, right? That's what we were concerned with. <laughs> yeah, I only know they had safety belts. Back then. <laughs> I know, right. Time to do a tree branch. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, but you know, he, he, uh, he was very involved. You know, he took me and I had a younger brother. And, I mean, just growing up, we just thought it was, uh, the coolest thing to be able to go and hang out with the guys at deer camp and hear the stories and just, it just, I was, I was hooked ever since. Right. So how about, I mean, bass fishing, man, cause I'm one of the, I'm terrible at fishing. I'm not good at it. I, I enjoy it. I actually enjoy, I think the, the beverages around the fishing hole more so than I think I do the fishing, but I've always heard folks talk about, you know, if you're especially fly, like trout fly fishermen. And I know you're, you know, we're more of the, you know, in the professional bass kind of, uh, tip, but how much similarities do you see between fishing, you know, someone who's fishing like at a very high level and, and archery hunting? Uh, well, you know, there's actually, there's, there's a lot of similarities. Um, believe it or not, even though you're in two different, uh, two different places. I mean, one year in the water, the other year in the woods. Um, and I'd always told people, every, I'd always told people, I said, Anybody can catch fish. You know, the, the hardest part is, is finding a fish. Um, kind of like, uh, you know, when I was guiding in Florida, you know, people say, well, you know, I'm going every day. 
and you're taking the people to the spots that you know that, that are fish are there, and all they have to do is drop down and catch them. The hardest part is going it and finding them. Right. Um, I, I guess a lot, uh, a lot of the people that that I met, you know, they would they're hunters uh, along with being fishermen, and you know, uh, just talking with a lot of these people, uh, you kind of get to learn just kind of like when I listen to your pot your your podcast. I mean, I hear the way you guys hunt up in Pennsylvania there as you hunt and just, you know, growing up here in the south, you know, just the uh the differences just it just kind of amazes me. Um to be hunting the same animals that just have two totally different types of techniques that we use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, that's I think it's a good a good segue or will be a good segue into the conversation that we're going to have because you know, you know I've talked a little bit offline and you know John will be going to Texas this year for the for the first time and like you know just you and i were talking about a little bit the other day it's just how you have to approach the hunt is is different you know i know you and i talked about doing some hunting in ohio together and we talked about that and kind of the juxtaposition to hunting in the south and how it's a little bit different especially like when you're talking about hunting beds versus you know in the south where you might not be doing so much of that just because you have the longer growing season and things are a lot thicker and for a lot longer period of time and and, and and so forth but before we do jump into all that um how was your 2017 deer season did you uh strike gold uh my 2017 deer season was was short and sweet we um you know i live right outside of of the houston area now and we kind of spent a lot of our later summer and early fall dealing with the aftermath of hurricane harvey oh yeah um which i guess i mean pretty much most of the nation saw how bad this area got flooded um, so it did put a little bit of a damper, I mean, uh, on, on our deer season. I, I was able to get in, uh, quite a bit of bow hunting, uh, even though I did not, uh, fill a pack. I, I let a lot of deer walk, uh, that I could have shot. I just holding out for, for that next level deer and, and just didn't, didn't, didn't get the job done, needless to say. And then halfway through the deer season, I started, uh, my CDL driving school and that just kind of put a, a quick end to the, <laughs> to the, to the rest of the deer season. Right, man. I'm curious when you have a natural, like a, <clears throat> a huge weather system like that come through and I'm not, you know, we talk about cold hunting, cold fronts and hunting weather and stuff like that, you know, during hunting season. But I'm curious, did you notice, you know, how did the, how did the wildlife react to, you know, a, a, a natural disaster like that? Like, what did you see? Did, they, did you see them act any different? Did you see them, you know, using different types of cover? Did you see anything like, I guess, out of the ordinary or unusual? Or like, I imagine they probably adapt to it better than we do as humans. But I'm just curious if you notice just anything different. You know, that's that's a great question, and um, I, it, it was such uh, tremendous flooding here. I mean, there was areas that got flooded here that have never even remotely seen flooding. I mean, that had yeah. some places had, you know. 10, 12, 15 feet of water um, that had never had standing water in them before. And it was crazy because you would see on the news these deer just swimming, uh, just trying to get away from this water. And I mean, there's deer in places that are just, you know, people's yards and just, it, it was crazy. And when the water finally started to subside, you know, there was just so much just brush and down trees and just trash. And, you know, it, it, it left a real mess. Right. Um, but the deer, I mean, it's like, you know, they did adapt, you know, it's like, uh, I still saw plenty of deer, I still saw plenty of sign. And so they, they're smart enough creatures. They were able to, to get away from it and they just slowly, you know, filtered back at least to the areas that, you know, that I was hunting around here. And, uh, I, I didn't really see any kind of a significant change one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The change is probably just avoid the water, which is you know pretty smart. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, not a not a complicated answer, probably in, in their minds. You know, it's uh, they're they're probably more used to dealing with aversion, you know, or having to uh, you know uh, you know avoid things that could harm them, kill them, you know, eat them, whatever the case might be. So it probably was just another another challenge to kind of endure. I would I would imagine is probably kind of how they how they viewed it. You know, I'm curious, man. I know you and I've yeah. talked a little bit in in you know, I know you just talked about the flooding in Texas and so forth. I know you take some trips every year, um, and hunt a couple of different places. So, you know, what States, like, I guess it's just narrow it down. Like what States are you predominantly hunting? That would you say that you hunt most consistently? Uh, I predominantly will hunt, uh, Texas, uh, Mississippi and Georgia. Okay. 
And what do you like for you when you're hunting those 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 different places? Is there anything distinctly different about each one of those in terms of how you have to approach it? Um, Georgia and Mississippi have a lot of similarities to them. Um, the terrain is pretty similar. Uh, a lot of the uh, the agricultural, I mean, it's a lot of you know soybeans, corn. Uh, Georgia, we have a lot of peanut fields, and even hunting in East Texas. Uh, it's a lot of the same similarities. As you start to move closer to, uh, like, the hill country in South Texas is when things really start to take a, uh, a considerable change. Um, but for the most part, I mean, those other areas, Georgia and Mississippi, have a, have a real strong similarities to one another. Right. Hey, John, have you – I'm curious, man, because I know – I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever even asked you this, but have you – I know you hunted Kentucky – you, of course, hunt Kentucky because you're from Kentucky – but have you hunted other places in the South beyond that? Never. Um, Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, and Iowa, and Montana. Montana. And okay. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. So, no, nothing South at all. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, I think, you know, what I've heard, I guess I'll, I'll frame it this way, what I've heard is that, you know, the culture of hunting is different as you kind of head south to to a degree, every it seems like the hunting culture has like its little pockets. Like we had a, a friend of mine on; it's from the, the northeast, and they have this thing up around the northeast, like the two hundred pound two hundred pound patch, which is like this thing that they recognize as far as the size of the deer, and it's not so much about the antlers per se. And um, you know, so each it seems like each region has like its own like little nuance, you know. So I'm just curious, man, like what. Do you notice any, as you're hunting like the different Southern states and so forth, do you notice any cultural differences that are specific to Texas that might be different, say, you know, in Ohio or, or even if you're looking at it from the places that you hunt from, you know, Texas to Georgia or Texas to Mississippi or, you know, any of the other states if you hunted in the South? Right. Um, absolutely. Texas, especially when you start getting towards South Texas, it, uh, I mean, Texas just I don't think a lot of people realize how big of a state uh, Texas is. Right. Um, there are different regions of Texas where you can kill anything from mule deer, whitetail. There's some areas that have bighorn sheep, uh, pronghorn antelope, you know, and obviously, you know, whitetail deer. Um, down where we hunt in, in South Texas, um, probably got maybe one of the biggest drawbacks for people coming from out of state is just your it's very limited uh, public land uh, to hunt. Uh, a lot of it is these private ranches, um, leases, um, and it, it can be very costly to hunt. Um, there's a lot of high fence ranches down there. Um, and so most of the time, if somebody looking to go and hunt down there, you're probably going to be paying pretty big bucks to, uh, to book a hunt down there unless you have some, some kind of a connection. Right. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned how, how big Texas is because it's, I mean, if you think about it in comparison to other states, right? Like Pennsylvania is a decent sized state, I would imagine. And it would fit in almost like a corner of, of Texas. It, it feels like the other thing that's kind of interesting right. about Texas is like, not only is there all that game, but the terrain, at least from what I've heard from different areas in Texas is drastically different. It's almost like they have four different like biospheres in Texas, right? It's like, you can go to places where it's like, it almost feels like Midwestern hunting, right? And then there's places you can go that feels like you're hunting out West and you can go to places where it feels like you're hunting, you know, you know, like in Mexico, maybe, you know what I mean? Like the South or whatever, you know, can, have you had experiences in those different kind of regions and how do you kind of approach them differently? Oh, no, absolutely. Um, you can be, say, for example, in, in East Texas, what they consider more of the, the piney woods region, and it's hardwood, lots of pine trees, but it's swamps, bayous. I mean, it's uh, cottonmouth country. I mean, this, this, all, the, all the things you love, <laughs> all the things you love. Um, if you move up towards, you know, northern Texas, uh, up around Amarillo, you know, the terrain kind of starts getting more mountainy, more hilly. I mean, up there is where you start finding your, your mule deer along with, you know, with your white tails. Um, as you kind of move south, and you get to about around Austin to about San Antonio is where you kind of get your your hill country, which is a lot more open, probably higher deer numbers. Um, you're not going to get as big a bodied or as big as racks as you would get as you start moving towards south Texas. And then 
once you get to South Texas, it's just kind of a whole nother, a whole nother world. You know, it's uh, just uh, mesquite trees. Um, everything down there is either going to stick you, cut you, or or bite you. Um, <laughs> it, it's just a, uh, you know, it's just a whole nother world. And so it's just amazing you can drive from from one side of the state to the other and just be in a completely different world. Right. And and you mentioned that most people are having to figure out a way to get on some type of private ground. There's not a lot of public land. So it, I guess what, given that the public land is limited, what, how would you rate the public land hunting there as far as like, are there quality, quality game on, you know, on those pieces of land? Is it, is it heavily pressured? Is it just kind of, I guess, set the scenario, the scenario for me for the public land hunting. Gotcha. Um, the best opportunity somebody would have for public land hunting here, and unfortunately it's for Texas re- Texas residents only, would be doing a uh, some kind of a, a draw hunt on a on a WMA. Mm-hmm. Um, there is national forest land that's going to be predominantly towards the eastern side of the state. Um, like I say, here where I live, uh, there is a big national forest. It's approximately one hundred sixty thousand acres. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like this. Anywhere else on public land you would go. I mean, if you if you put in your time and your work and you're willing to get back into some of these other areas that people aren't willing to go, uh, you can you can kill some good deer. Um, you know, they're definitely there. But uh, weekends, you can just bet that there's going to be a lot of people out there. Um, so you, you do need to get off the beaten path and and try to get back in areas that people aren't going to try to try to access. Right. So th- there's opportunities there, but it, it's. For, for Texas, as big as it is, you would think there would be more opportunities at, at public hunting, but there, there, there's just there, there are few and far between. Right. I like how you kind of mentioned South Texas being that it's going to either stick you, you know, I don't remember what the other one was, or, or bite you. That's uh, I'm not friendly with snakes, and I'm imagining you kind of referring to some, some snakes there, right, in South Texas. Yeah, yeah, there's a, I, I really, <laughs> I think you were in, in Texas, you're going to find a bit down there seems to be, uh, seems to be a few more than, than other areas for some reason. Right, John, how, uh, how, how you feeling about that? You know, I'm not a big fan of snakes, <laughs> um, but as long as they don't bite me, I won't try to bite them, I guess. Like, <laughs> and, you know, everybody tells me about that, you know, they're like, where's, where's some good snake boots while you're down there, while you're walking around and. Um, duly noted. <laughs> right. Duly, duly noted. So I want to get in. Like, duly this, noted. <laughs> I think, you know, now I, I kind of want to shift gears and kind of, I guess, talk to you a little bit about here about just kind of getting advice for hunting Texas. And this, this is the part that John probably would be, you know, wanting to kind of ask some questions here. Cause this is, you know, probably be more specific to what he's going to encounter here in the, uh, in the fall when he heads to Texas. So, I guess I want to start off and I'll just ask this broadly and then we'll try to kind of dive into, I guess, some different pieces of, of this first question. So if you were taking someone, let's take John as the example here, since he is going to Texas and he's never hunted Texas before, right? What would it be, Correct. I guess, the advice that you would give or the approach that you would suggest for helping someone to get on deer in Texas if they've never hunted there before? So just like in general, now, are you so, talking if, about hunting? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Clint. Oh, I was going to ask you: Are you talking hunting uh, like a private ranch or the public land? So I think so. Let's go from the perspective of um, let's go from the perspective of the uh, private ranch. So you're going to hunt someone's okay. someone's private ground. You got access somewhere, or you have a, or you've never hunted Texas Texas before, and you got a lease for the first time. Or let's just, I guess, go from that perspective. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, the, I would say probably some of the most important things that you can have out here is a, is a really good set of optics uh, where you can sit in glass. Because here, most everything is going to be from, from elevated blinds. Um, you hunt what, what they call down here is basically senderos, where they just cut a, a lane through, through the brush, and it's usually turned into a food plot. Um, down here, a lot of you know baiting is is legal, so a lot of a lot of guys will you know put out corn, hunt over feeders. Um, you, you have such high deer numbers here. I mean, you're always going to see see deer. I mean, Texas has over <laughs> four million deer. 
uh, in, in the entire state. So the, the, the deer, you're going to have a problem seeing deer just finding that, that mature deer uh, that you're, or whatever it is, you know, you're looking for. Uh, a lot of the outfitters down here, like I say, they will do a lot of spot, uh, spot and stall hunting. Uh, a lot of, like they've done some ground blinds or elevated blinds. Some, some of the guys do the safari style hunting where you're <laughs> put you up in a, in a high rack of a truck and, and drive you around. You see a deer and then you'll make it, make a stalk on foot. So, you know, a lot of it just kind of depends on, on the ranch and, and who the outfitter is, where he's going. Before we continue our conversation, let's talk about Wicked Tree Gear saws. Hardcore deer hunters need tools that can keep up. We don't baby our gear and we take on whatever mother nature happens to dish out while we're on stand. Check out Wicked Tree Gear hand saws and pull saws at wickedtreegear.com. Use the promo code TRUTH to save yourself 20% on your next purchase with free ground shipping. And get a saw that's tough enough to work as hard as you hunt. And now back to the show. So what about from the perspective of someone, you know, say in, in, in John's case where he's got some access to some property, and but it's still going to be a go it, go it alone kind of perspective. You know, he's going to be, it, it'll be... DIY in the sense that he's not going to necessarily have someone kind of showing him where to go or, you know, what type of terrain he should check out or where or how he should set up a, a blind or whether he should set up a stand or, you know, probably aren't any trees to set up a stand. And as we, as John and I kind of understand them, it's probably going to be more of like a tower blind or something like that. So if they were, if you were walking onto a piece of property that your buddy said, Hey, yeah, you can come hunt my 2000 acres, but you know, I'm not going to be there that week while you're there. How would you approach that? Um, I would definitely go and check out, uh, water holes. I would also check out, um, if there's any kind of agriculture and a lot of those, the ranches here, they will, you know, livestock is, is a, is obviously a huge thing in South Texas. And some of these ranches will have too many cattle, cattle on the ranch and, uh, you get overgrazing becomes a popular, um, uh, a problem. Uh, just there's too much competition for food. Um, if you do get on a ranch where there is a good, Good buck to doe ratio is a good healthy deer population. Plenty of food. Um, you know, calling can be a very effective uh, technique down here, especially rattling. Um, I would always like to get the spot where I can see pretty well, where there's on the edge of a of a sendero or on, on a field edge or whatnot. And calling can be really effective. You know, depending on the on the time of year he's down here. Right. So, John, what time of year you you planning to be there? Uh, let's see. Probably it's going to be somewhere around December 5th, December 7th, something like that. So what, uh, what, what does that mean in terms of, I guess, you know, what, when does the, the rut really kind of kick in down there? John? Yeah, he'll be hitting it probably right about prime time. Um, for South Texas, it's, I mean, I've seen it as early as mid November, but most, most years that you're going to, it's going to be usually a little after Thanksgiving, like you're being beginning of December. So who should be hitting the rut um, about perfect? And down here, it's usually pretty consistent. Uh, the rut usually consistently happens about the same time every year. All right. What's the uh, what's the, the the sex ratio look like? I mean, it's like if if calling works, you know, as, as well as you know, I've heard or have read, and as well as you're kind of saying that that it does sometimes. I'm imagining the the buck to doe ratio must be pretty good. Uh, I mean, certain ranches it is. I mean, down here, you know, in, in South Texas, I mean, this is kind of where uh, management all kind of started, you know, getting started. Mm-hmm. Um, down here, I mean, it's all about management, you know, trying to keep a good buck to doe ratio. Uh, you know, they're always talking about management, uh, nutrition. Um, I know uh, I've heard your guest uh, when, when you had Davis Moore and you know, Tecamani, um uh, come down here. There's a lot of, you know, that's, that's a huge business down here. Um, so with, uh, I kind of forgot what the, what the question was. Um, uh, it was just, oh, the, as far as the calling goes. Yeah. It was just the, you know, I, I, you mentioned that calling works and I've, of course I've heard that and read that other places and stuff like that. And so you, I was just, it, I imagine that the, the buck to doe ratio is good. And it sounds like that, you know, herd structure is good. If those, if those types of tactics are working in those areas. No, absolutely. Yeah. And so, yeah, if he's on a place that does have a good, you know, a decent buck to doe ratio, absolutely rallying, uh, will work. If it's, uh, if there's not a good buck to doe ratio, I mean, you've got, you know, 
30 does to, to every buck, you know, you're probably not going to have very much success with it. Right. So I'm curious. There's just, there's no, there's just no competition for, for does. Right. It's like, why go get your ass kicked if you can just walk around the corner and get another one? Yeah, it's kind of like Pennsylvania. <laughs> exactly. <It's, laughs> you know what I mean? It's, exactly. You know, it's kind of what we, what we face, what we face in, you know, PA for the most part. You and I were having an interesting conversation the other day on the phone about bedding areas because you were, you were just mentioning that we've had, you know, John and I have had guests on that talk a lot about, you know, hunting buck beds and, and, and stuff like that. And it's definitely something that, uh, I try to employ some of, especially if I'm hunting, you know, public ground, I try to figure out where, you know, a buck might be betting and make and set up closer to it. And I give my, give myself a, a chance as he's getting up out of bed to feed in the afternoon or, and, uh, you know, that's kind of one of the approaches I'll employ in certain scenarios. And you were just kind of mentioning like the difference between, you know, that's, that's interesting that that's the way we approach it up here. Cause you were like, you know, I, you would never even find one possibly in Texas and some of those places in the South. And I was just, it, it didn't dawn on me until you, until you said it. So, I mean, how do you, I guess, define bedding areas and I guess explain a little bit why it's challenging to find buck bedding areas specifically in, in, in the South in Texas. Well, I mean, <clears throat> To try to find, I mean, yeah, and it's funny you say that because when I heard you guys talk about bedding, I mean, that's just a a technique or something. You know, when we're scouting, that's kind of one of the last things that you you really look for, or even really come across, just because it is the cover down here. It, it is. It's so thick and it can be so dense, and it's just it's next to impossible to find to find beds. I mean, you can obviously know when you have an eye, you can get a general idea of where the deer are bedding. Like if you're hunting a whatever a food source. And the deer are pretty much, you, you're getting a pattern. You can kind of see when they're consistently coming out in the field and where they're coming out. And you kind of know what's back in, in that area. You can kind of get a general idea of possibly where they're bedding. But as far as trying to actually uh, locate a, a specific buck bed, per se, and, and try to hunt that deer, just it's that's just something that, I mean, myself, I don't do. And I just, all the people I know that hunt has just never been a, a, a tactic or a technique that, we, that I've really used too much in the South. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because I mean, it's you know a lot of folks, you know, in in this area, and I, you know, I think the the Midwest, it might not be as prevalent. I mean, I know some folks that do it, you know, pretty heavily as you get into like some swamp country and stuff like that, whether it's you know Wisconsin and so forth, um, you know. But it seems like some Midwestern hunting, you're still kind of you know banking on that, you know, funneling, you know, some type of terrain feature that's going to funnel deer, or you know, and and try to you know locate you know a travel corridor through a pinch point on a on a bed to food pattern or something like that seems to be money around here you know in, in pennsylvania at least it's uh you know I, I think i think in some of the higher pressure states that you, you you might see people concentrate on hunting bedding more often specifically buck beds because you know that might be the only chance you you possibly see them because they 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 move so close to to dark i mean and deer typically move close to dark as it is but especially the amount of pressure i'll just take pennsylvania for instance it's like I mean, that buck might not get up, even up out of his bed until 15 minutes before dark. And if you're sitting further than 150, 100 yards away from his bed, there's a chance he's going to get up out of bed and you, you'll never see him during shooting hours or shooting light. You know, so I think in some high pressure gotcha. states in areas, I think it makes more sense because they just don't quite move as freely as, as you would maybe want. Um, and so you kind of have to maybe get a little bit more aggressive than you would in, in some states. But, you know, speaking of, you know, bed to food patterns, I'm just curious, man, you know, especially with Texas having the diverse habitat, you know, in the, in the different areas of Texas, like, so in South Texas specifically, like what are your dominant food sources for the, for the most part? I mean, you know, what are they, you know, what type of agriculture, you know, are they, or is, is in that area? And then also what type of browse do they have? I mean, do they have, you know, here you have acorn trees and all kinds of stuff like that that they can get into in the fall, but I'm imagining there it's probably quite different. Yeah. Um, down here, well, primarily in the in the region, I'm just going to kind of stay with with the South Texas region. Um, actually, believe it or not, uh, prickly pear attack is is one of <laughs> a deer's favorite foods uh, down in this area. Um, uh, the mesquite trees produce a little food they call we call them mesquite beans that the deer seem to love. Uh, there's some areas that have a lot of live oaks that produce uh, you know uh, acorns just like anywhere else would the, the deer will really really start to get to get on in the early fall in fact I've, I've seen them not even hardly touch corn when the live oaks start dropping and to go feed on the acorns um 
And then in the spring, uh, you know, when we get lots of rain, I mean, it just, uh, it just creates tons of browse and even bigger uh, vegetation. So there's just there's more stuff than I could even begin to try to to, to try to name that, that grows that the right. that, that the deer love to eat. Um, as far as agriculture goes, I mean, uh, you know, you'll still get uh, I like to say alfalfa, uh, winter wheat. Um, it will, I would say will probably be the most uh, prominent agriculture uh, down here. You're not going to find uh, in this area soybeans and corn and you know, stuff like that. Right. So John, do you have any, uh, any kind of specific questions about your, about your hunt that you're thinking about as we're going? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, the question of, uh, the question of baiting and stuff like that. And it's always kind of one of those topics like when in Rome, you know what I mean? Kind of deals. Yep. I myself, um, you know, even coming from Kentucky, Kentucky is a bait legal state. Um, but I never hunted over bait and, um, now I did supplemental feeding, I did mineral sites, you know, and all that kind of stuff, but, um, never, never hunted over bait. And, you know, as I've been told, you know, Hey, some of these ranches you can go on, they're so, so big that, you know, you'll see deer, you know, like you mentioned earlier, but trying to get deer within bow range, um, is a lot different than getting them in, you know, within rifle range. And, um, you know, some, you know, I've heard a lot of guys say, look, when you go to Texas, sometimes you almost have to put out a little bit of corn to kind of get the deer in close or get in between a water source or get in between a supplemental feeding site and kind of cut them off in the past, so to speak. Is that kind of par for the course? No, absolutely. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Even when you're bow hunting, um, there's just not really anything considered, you know, small food plot, <laughs> small food plots around here. What it seems like now, some of the races have started implementing smaller, maybe one or two acres, just little micro plots. I guess is what you would call them, um, with a little kind of brush in a ground blind to try to give you a boat. I mean, like I said, you're always almost going to get those and smaller bucks coming out there. But if you're trying to kill that trophy, um, you know, in the rut, it can obviously happen. But just, I just personally don't think hunting over a corn pile, you're going to kill that you know, uh, a super mature deer. I mean, he, I, I think they get wise to them. Um, sure. One little trick that, that I use, um, down here where we hunt is, you know, it's always usually pretty warm. And we'll get some cold weather, uh, in, in the fall, but for the most part, then when these bucks start running and they run so hard and it seems like water on a lot of these ranches is, is a key. And one thing that we've kind of done over the, I mean, just, we've been doing this for 20 years is uh, a lot of these water sources down here, there's usually all, almost always a windmill. And we've actually constructed little blinds up in the tops of these windmills that are usually sitting right on top of the, of the water. And, I mean, the bucks, I mean, he may not be there long, but they'll come by to look for a hot dough, maybe grab a drink, but it's always going to be a uh, pretty much a, a money shot, usually 30 yards or less on most of the locations that we have. And so... Mm-hmm. If I, uh, I would me personally, I think I, if I, I take a pair of binoculars, I'd look for any kind of windmills, and I'd make my way <laughs> to one of those windmills, see if there, there's water there, what kind of sign there, and I would not hesitate for a second to set up in a windmill over a water hole. Sure. Yep, makes sense. Go ahead, John. Do you have another question? No, I was just saying that. I mean, that makes that makes sense. The um, now you're you're front, you know, you're a Texan, right? I mean, you're through and through. Correct. As a as a hunter in Texas, um, and, and I've asked this question to another Texan. Uh, you actually mentioned him once before, uh, you know, earlier in the podcast. Um, so I, I work with with David Morris and you know Bucks of Tecumani guys and and uh, the Tecumani Holdings Company. And I asked uh, David one time. I went down there and. I said, so uh, you guys down here in Texas, you guys ever catch any crap, you know, about hunting high fence deer? And and he's like, only from you Midwestern guys, you know? <laughs> and um, <laughs> so we kind of joked back and forth about it. And and we had, you know, we had a good laugh. And and I think there's a, there's a different mentality. And, and you had even said this before, uh, as far as livestock. Um, you know, his thing was the deer are almost like livestock where it's, you're not so much trying to keep the deer in as you're trying to keep the your neighbors from taking your deer or 
keeping your neighbors out, so to speak. Um, right. But I, it, it is very different how there's a, a different perception, I think, that people take, you know, to deer hunting in different geographical locations. And Texas almost seems to be uh, an anomaly. It's kind of a state, you know, it's kind of an area all on its own. You know, the hunting style is very different, and the perception of deer hunting can be different, you know, in that area. What's your thoughts on that? Well, no, that that you're you're definitely spot on, and I think one of the one of the big different one of the biggest differences uh, in hunting, say uh, a ten thousand acre high fence ranch in South Texas uh, versus say one of these little hundred acre deer pens in Ohio is that I mean most avid hunters would never consider shooting a deer you know out of such a small enclosure, and I think this is where the concept of high fence hunting gets a uh, gets a black eye. Um, here in Texas, I mean, some of these, like I say, it's nothing for a, a 10,000 acre ranch to, uh, you know, to have a, to have a high fence around it. Um, and I think with a lot of these, uh, these smaller little operations that are sometimes these people will fence in, uh, you know, 50, uh, a hundred acres and, uh, basically take a, a 10 raised deer and, <laughs> and, and let it go. And I think these, a lot of these people, uh, you know, there's such a steady demand across the country uh, for that type of operation. I think that um, you're always going to find certain inv- individuals who try to beat the system, and especially when there's money involved. It seems like everyone wants to find an easier way to put a trophy white pill on the wall, and I think some people are willing to do almost anything to make it happen. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, you know, the high, just the high fence in general, because I know – the other night, whenever you and I were talking, and Joey, you know, we we talked a little bit about high fence, and just even bringing it up makes made me like squeamish, even talking about it. You know what I mean? Which is which is weird because when you're talking about a ten thousand acre tract to land or whatever it is, it's like you put a fence around that thing. It's like you know, it's that amount of ground. It's like that's still, you know, I don't know. You don't get much more fair chase than that. You know what I mean? It's like it's you're not cornering and it's not in a small, it doesn't, it's not as if it doesn't have escape routes, but people just feel really weird talking about it from the, from the Midwest. You know what I mean? It's like, and I don't know if it's because we just don't have exposure to it or, um, you know, or if because all we've ever heard about is whenever, you know, as you were kind of mentioning some of these other operations that might be doing it, you know, poorly. And, uh, I think the other part of it too, is I think mistakenly, I think when people hear of high fence, they think also, you know, um, some folks might, and this is just me, you know, hypothetically speaking, hypotheticals here might think of deer farm, which then you start to connect those things to CWD. And then you think CWD bad, so deer farm bad equals high fence bad. And so I think it, they're just kind of caught in this vicious circle of, of, uh, you know, mislabeling, possibly misinformation and misunderstanding potentially. I don't know. What do you think? No, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of these, these high fence ranches in Texas, I mean, these guys, I mean, they've been managing these ranches for, I mean, you know, this is, goes back, you know, 50, 60 years. And these guys have got genetics on their ranch. I mean, a lot of them have brought in, um, you know, done so much. I mean, they, they basically got it down to a science. I mean, they're trying to grow these particular type deer. They want, they don't want people coming on their ranch. They don't want the deer leaving their ranch. And, you know, I, I just think it got, you know, so much about, uh, to be about the money. I mean, cause some of these guys, I mean, you know, it's obscene what they charge for, for some of these hunts. And not only are you paying a, a fee to go and hunt their property and stay at their ranch, uh, then you start adding trophy fees on top of that. I mean, it's not out of the question for, 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 the, for uh, one guy to go and do a deer hunt to cost upwards of, of, of 20,000 bucks to kill a Whoa. trophy deer. Wow. Um, Oh yeah, and then you know when you do start getting far enough south, I mean I, I had some people tell me you know that they did the high fences to keep uh, whatever you know people from crossing the border from <laughs> coming across their ranch, which is right. something you do see uh, down in South Texas. Uh, you know, border Patrol is, is is definitely very active, and uh, you know it's something you don't really think about when you go down there to hunt, but I mean that's a it's reality, and they're constantly to see helicopters flying over. And I mean, I've had people say they've actually been sitting in a stand before and here comes a little group of people <laughs> coming across their property. And so I've so, never personally seen that, but it's, it's, uh, you hear about it all the time. Right. That's wild, man. It's uh that would be uh that would be a first for me in a tree stand, John. I don't know about you. You, you, you used to chase people for a living. It's like, you might have a, 
you might try to jump in the action. <laughs> that sounds like a good time. <laughs> a, little, yeah, you, <laughs> a little double dipping on the hunt. You know, you could do a little deer hunting, a little people yeah. hunting, be all good. Yeah. Oh man, uh, John. You know what ranch that you're going to be hunting? I don't know if you're. If you're... Um. So you know, as it gets closer, my plan was I was going to inquire more about the location because I'm, you know, I'm a a big Google Earth and um, you know Topo kind of a guy. So I always like to explore the areas and see if I can at least get a little bit of a head start going as far as some of my scouting. Um, what I do know at this point is that it is um, it's it's a part of the King Ranch, um, but it is a private lease. Uh, it's like um, there's a fence on two sides, um, and it's hill country. That's all I know. Okay. Yeah. The, oh, wow, King Ranch. I mean, that's uh, that, that's a big town. I mean, that's like, a, I guess, next to maybe uh, Kakamani, uh King Ranch. Is, I mean, that's I think that ranch is like 800,000 acres or even over 800,000 acres. I do know they have. Uh, other little subsidiaries of, of the King Ranch, um, but you know, there, there's no telling exactly you know where it could be. I mean, more than likely you're you're going to be down there in that that triangle somewhere. So you, I mean, you'll definitely be in in Megabuck Land for sure. That sounds terrible. That's I feel awesome. Real bad. I feel real bad for you, John. I'll just be even more disappointed now when I don't shoot one. <laughs> Dude, I told you, I told you the other night. I was like, I got a feeling you're bringing back a hammer on film. <laughs> The, uh, no, it's kind of neat. Um, you know, whenever I first got involved with Tecamani, I, I joked with them uh, in my employment contract, and I said, I'd like to negotiate one more thing in my contract. I'd like one whitetail hunt um, every week, you know, uh, to be thrown in on the employment contract, and I couldn't make it happen. And one of our investors, um, you know, he's like, hey, what are you talking about? Heck yeah, come on down here, you know? So, um, So it yeah. worked out pretty good. Yeah, it sounds uh man. Well, yeah, <laughs> you can, see, you can hear John. You can hear yeah, him both. Pretty smooth maneuvering if you work out that deal. That's pretty strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, John's a wheeler and a dealer, man. Like he he drives a hard bargain. I do know that about him. So if uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's years of grinding and scraping for everything you got. You know what I mean? <laughs> you get that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like man. <laughs> But hey, I wanted to ask a question because you started talking about looking for sign, like when you were going to those, uh, you know, checking out the windmills and stuff like that for potential blind or stand locations or, you know, putting a, something in the in the windmills to turn out of. And you mentioned looking for sign around those. So what type of sign? Because I mean, I know from like you know Midwest and hunting in here in Pennsylvania, it's like what I would look for walking into the timber in terms of sign. But Texas, I would have no clue what to look for in terms of sign, like. You know, do you, you know, and this might sound really kind of novice of me, but it's like, do you look for scrapes the same way? Do you look for rubs the same way? Do you look for like, so how do those things kind of manifest themselves in Texas? No, you, you do. And it's just basically just because of the, the terrain is so different. I mean, you, you'll definitely, you'll find, you'll find scrapes, uh, you'll find rubs. Uh, down here, I mean, they'll, they'll definitely rub the mesquite trees. I mean, down here, they'll, I mean, they still rub fence posts. I mean, okay. you can see a find a bar bar fence, and they'll actually rub the you know the fence post. Um, you, you'll find scrapes. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily would say you would find a, a definitive scrape line per se. Maybe going through the brush. I mean, you'll definitely find them around some of these field edges, stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but for the most part, I mean, it's just other than the terrain being different. It, it's all. I mean, the, the white tails they still act and, and, and do the same thing. It's just. My biggest thing when, when I'm trying to look is, is I just try to find a spot where I can see a long way. Even if I just take a day and just go sit up in an elevated blind where I can sit there and just kind of maybe see two or three different food plots at one time or overlook a couple of different watering holes. And uh, at that time of year, I mean, they're, they're, those bucks are going to be, I mean, running like crazy. And they, they, they steadily, steadily will check these, these little watering holes. And that's why they, those have always been kind of one of my little favorite spots to hunt because you can build a stand up in these windmills and usually there's a little bit of noise mm -hmm. uh from the windmill and because it's usually the wind blowing and so to me it's kind of a great little cover because you can kind of draw and make a little bit of movement even if you make a little noise but the deer really are not looking up there and paying a whole lot of attention to that windmill right so you you mentioned wind and i, I know you had mentioned even to me previously that you can get some 
you know, pretty decent wind, you know, in, in, in those areas. What's, what does that kind of usually look like? I mean, is it typically pretty, a pretty windy hunt during that time of the year or is it, you know, not so bad? I mean, it can vary. I mean, you could have one day where it's just completely dead calm and, but it's nothing for it to blow 20 to 30 miles an hour. Um, and so days like that, you know, I'm not so sure it wouldn't be nice to be in a, in a ground blind instead of trying to shoot a bow in 30, <laughs> 30 mile an hour winds in the, in the wide open. Right. Um, but it, it, the wind, you know, it doesn't seem to bother the deer. Uh, they move when it's calm or, or when it's windy. I mean, I just, I sat out there before and it's just gale and I'm thinking, I, I, you know, I can't even believe they're moving, but they, they, it does not bother them one single bit. Right. Is access a challenge? Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm imagining most everything's pretty flat. So, I mean, is, is ac- access a bitch or is it, you know, or is it, do you have to not be so particular about it as you would be say in the North or the Midwest? No, on, on what was that? The access. So like, ac- like stand access. So like getting, getting to and from. Oh, yeah, getting to your stand? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, hunting, you know, some of these food sources and stuff. I mean, ideally, um, you know, depending on the outcome, a lot, a lot of the guys wanted you to, they'll, they'll want you to stay in the stand until they actually, they would rather come and whatever, pick you up and they'll pull the truck right up to, to the stand. They'd rather spook the deer with the truck than have you get out of the stand and whatever, walk down the edge of the field and, and spook all the deer off. Um, most of the, uh, the water, the, the water holes that I'm telling you about is, is stuff that, most of those deer are not going to be coming in there, like I say, before. I'm not going to say that they won't, but I just never had a problem blowing deer in or out of there going to, to those type of areas. It seemed kind of seemed more of a, uh, a spot where they would seem to come in a little bit later in the morning and a little bit earlier in the afternoon before they went to go feed or do whatever it was they were going to do. Right, nice. So, John, do you have uh, – I know we're coming up getting here close to to an hour here. I want to be sensitive of your time. I have one last question I want to ask. But before I do that, John, do you have – is there any other burning questions you have about uh, Texas hunting before your voyage? Um, I will need his uh, phone number and email contact, and I I have a feeling I'm going to have a lot of questions before this hunt. Yeah, yeah we can we can make that happen for sure. I, I don't want to speak for you, Joe. You might not want – you might not want to – Brody to get a hold of it if if uh, if he if Utah is tangling with Brody at some point you know so no it, it's all good it's just I wish I could be more give you more specific it's just it, man, it, in this area it's just it's just so hard to do yeah it's so hard because these ranches like I say is they're all so different and I mean there's they're the same but they're different just so many different ways that some of these people want you to hunt it'd be nice if they could just say hey you know if John didn't work out that deal like you should and if he kind of gets to be on his own, I mean, to me, that would be the ideal. And right. having someone just drop you off at a stand and say, I'll be back in four hours or whatever. Right. Right. So with so that, that's not the kind of deal it is. Right. So, so with that, uh, we will be sensitive to your time here. I have one last question for you. I always like to end with a, uh, with a story. So if you wouldn't mind, give me a, give me a personal story for, uh, of a hunt that you've been on that, uh, that's meaningful to you. It could be a near miss, could be a great harvest. It could be that you got drunk at deer camp and didn't go hunting the next day, whatever the case is. Uh, just, uh, give me all the details. Oh man. Okay. Uh, probably one of my most memorable hunts would be, uh, this is actually going to be in, in Tennessee and, uh, probably the very first really, I would say big buck I kill with a bow, but it's kind of a, uh, kind of a, Kind of a weird story, but uh, kind of going back to my fishing days, I had bought a, uh, my first home, and it was back in this little subdivision, and just a typical little cookie-cutter home, nothing fancy, but it was kind of a rural area where the subdivision was. And uh, I had uh, my house kind of backed up to some open fields and woods. It was kind of like a little TVA power line, and I had a, uh, kind of showing my age, I had a big red three-wheeler that I used to go back there <laughs> and, and ride around, and uh one day I was kind of, as I moved in there in the summer and back then everything was so green. I really couldn't see back too far in the woods, but as fall started coming along, I could see a, a lake back, uh, in the trees, but I knew that was private property back where this lake was. And I, I really wanted to go and bass fish this lake. And so I kind of started stooping around trying to figure out who owned this property. And, uh, they, I found out who owned it. It was, a, it was just a, an elderly lady that owned the property. She had about 600 acres and I actually went and knocked on her door and asked her if I could just go and bass fish at her lake. And she said, yeah, that, that wouldn't be a problem at all. And so I hop on my big red one day and go back there, and I'm walking around the lake bass fishing. I'm kind of looking around. I start seeing, you know, 
a lot of deer sign, and I had really not seen too many deer uh, back in this area, just you know, riding around and goofing around. I started making so much noise, and I was walking down the edge of the lake, and one of your favorite no-shouldered friends was along the bank, so I thought, I'm just going to kind of detour <laughs> around this guy, and uh, kind of got back in the woods and started noticing, you know, I saw to see a few rubs over here and a few scrapes. I'm like, man, I said, there's, you know, sort of a little amount of a deer around here. And so, so I'm going to go ask her if I, if she'd mind if I, if I bow hunted back here. And so I went back to her house and asked her if I could bow hunt. And, uh, she said, I, you know, I don't mind if you bow hunt, but you know, you can't shoot any guns and then I, I don't want you bringing anybody back here. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely respect that. So, she kind of showed me on a, brought me in the house, and she kind of showed me, she had a little map, she kind of showed me her boundaries, and there was actually a couple soybean fields on the place, and it was nice, mature, hard wood, just, I mean, she had a beautiful piece of property, and, and I couldn't wait to get out there and start doing some scouting around, and it didn't take long, and I kind of got around the edge of the bean fields and started getting into the woods a little bit, and I found this one spot that was just, I mean, you couldn't draw up a, a, a better spot at kind of came off the top of the bean field and he went down a small ridge and there was a big sand ditch down there and the sand ditch was probably eight to ten feet deep but the the banks were so steep i mean there was only certain areas where you could cross and i did find a spot where they were crossing that just looked like i mean cattle had been crossing this ditch and i was like oh man this is this is a great crossing but the problem was there was not any really good trees really close within bow range of this crossing and back then this is uh I think I was in an old baker climbing tree stand. I don't know if you even know. know I've never heard of this. John may have. Uh, There's basically a death trap. Uh, Not the best, definitely not the best or safest to stand. But I did did find one tree that I could get in, but I can only get up probably about 10 or 12 feet. Um, So I couldn't get up quite as high as I wanted to go, but that was the only tree that I could really uh, get in to get a good shot at at that crossing. And so, um, uh, I would go and hunt this place, you know, b- before work. Cause it's like I said, this was in riding distance of my house. I, mean, I could hop on my three wheel and be there in that stand in 20 minutes. Um, so one morning I got up before work and was going back in there and got up in my stand, you know, about 30 minutes before daylight. And it was just a, a perfect morning. And, uh, I looked up and I could see a doe walking the fence line on the edge of that bean field. And here she came right down the little ridge and kind of down in the, uh, before we got to the ditch, it was, Little brushes. There was some honeysuckle down there, a lot of briar, just, just pretty thick stuff. And then once she went down in the ditch, the ditch was deep enough where she, you know, I couldn't see her. She disappeared, and I saw her when she came up the other side. And she was only, you know, not even, I think she was 19 yards from actually where I had my stand set up. And she just kind of cruised off, and I could look up, and I could see uh, this big eight point coming down the same trail. I'm like, oh, man, here he comes. <laughs> and so he did. Yeah, he came on the same exact trail she came in on. She came down the ditch. He came down the ditch and came up the other side. And I mean, he's sitting there just, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a perfect shot. And I draw back and I don't know what I did, man, but I shot right over his back and missed. And I could just see my arrows sticking in the ground and I'm just sick. And, you know, he just, he didn't even know he stood. He just, he knew something went right. He just kind of tried it off, but I never could get a, another shot. So I'm just sitting there. I'm just kind of pissed off. Can't think. I cannot believe I, I shot right over that deer. And I probably sat there for another 15 or 20 minutes and I look up and from the same direction that eight pointer went, I could see another deer walking the fence line on the, you know, I can tell he's coming down the same trail and he's got his head down. So I can't really tell exactly how big he is. And finally he turns and starts coming down that same trail. I'm going to go across the same crossing. And when I looked up and I could just see, all I could see was rack. I'm like, man, I said, that's a stud. Nice. <laughs> that's a stud. And man, I'm, I'm still already shaking from, from the settle. I'm still nervous and, and kind of upset. And so I don't know if I'm more mad or more nervous, but he crosses. I mean, this picture perfect. He comes down to the ditch and when he's down, down low, you can't see me, man, I'm at full draw. And then when he comes up the other side and I let it go and I could just hear that flop. And I think back then I was shooting uh old school Easton double X 75 aluminum arrows with, <laughs> Thunderhead 125 broadheads. <laughs> was that with your band and, uh, piece of bam your your bamboo stick and that twine <laughs> that you're using back in the day? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm sitting my yeah, I'm in a camo thong with yeah. my bamboo <laughs> and my twine. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh, so he anyways he hauls he hauls butt and I mean I, I knew I I put a good shot on him and I sat up there for about another. Uh, about another 30 minutes it seemed like two hours i, I couldn't take any more so i got down and 
and looked at Maryland. It was, you know, just, just everything you wanted to see. And then it was a blood trail. You could, you could just jog down the blood trail, but the whole time that, you know, this kind of happened pretty fast and it seemed a lot longer than it, than it was, but I never really thought to count points or, or anything. I just saw, you know, a big rack. And so anyway, that he only ran probably 60 or 70 yards and, the way he was, he was laying when I walked up, he was kind of laying away from me, and I could just see this rack sticking up. And I'm like, man, that's a, you know, and I'd never killed anything. I'm talking, you know, back then, that, the biggest thing I'd ever killed was probably a 100 inch eight point. Right. Uh, at best. And so when I walked up to it and picked up his head, and I was just, I, I couldn't believe it. Actually, it was a, uh, he had 15 scoreable points and a, almost a 24 inch spread. Jeez. Uh, 218 pounds field dressed. Nice. And so that was, my biggest buck to date and probably one of my most uh, memorable hunts. And just uh, to kill a deer like that in Tennessee back back then when there weren't high deer numbers and just kind of gaining access to that property just kind of made the whole thing uh, kind of special. Yeah, man. That's a good story, dude. I mean, everything from, you know, knocking on the door to being at the right place at the right time, having a miss. You know what I mean? It's like that's the – you went through the, the full emotions on that in that one hunt, that's for sure. But – uh Oh, the full thing, man. I did my best Eddie Haskell impersonation when I met that lady trying to <laughs> <You're> right, <laughs> get yeah. on this property. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. So, and I'm glad you shot it yeah, with man. that bamboo stick and a uh, piece of twine and your camo thong. So, you know, it's a... Uh... It's oh, like, dude, uh, that's you know that's what even made it more special. I'll be sure to send you some pictures so you can yeah. up on Facebook for everyone to check out. Yeah, you can leave the camo thong out of those. That'd be all right. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, awesome. Well, hey, dude, thanks for coming on the show. I, I, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, I'm glad that you and I got to connect and, you know, we're able to talk to each other now and make a new friend in hunting, which is always, always good. But I appreciate your time. Be careful on the road, and I'll talk to you soon. Clint, my pleasure. Johnny Utah, take care, man, and give me a shout. All right, we'll do it, man. Thank you. You're welcome, brother. Take care. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. We'd like to thank Joey for joining us. And we'd, of course, like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast to make sure it's uh, each episode is delivered directly to your digital devices. We'd be super appreciative if you would do those two things. And before we shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout-out to our partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. Wicked Tree Gear, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Trophy Ridge, Ozonix, Obsession Bows, Tecamani Seed, Glacier Coolers, Ramcat Broadheads, and Trophy Taker Rests. And until next time, we'll see y'all. November's on my heels. Makes me proud, makes me steal. I could show you through the door. If it all It takes a special No one to call a fall Damaged heads Broken letters Rationalize yourself in numbers But I I